Chandra Arthoplasty is more theoretical for a postgraduate, but some ideas about the language that, that we generally talk. So the joint replacement scenario has been like this. In it is, it was hip replacement, which was inherently a stable construct. Just put the socket, put the ball. Once it is gone in, more often than not, it will work whatever way the socket and ball may have been. So very, very forgiving. Mobility was there in all direction, but not that much, limited mobility. So basically it is a very friendly joint for beginning orthopedic surgeons. That's why most people can do hip replacement very, very easily. How about knee replacement? It came in 90s, a little more tricky because not a stable joint like ball and socket here. The mobility was only in flexion extension. That is the grace. It was not very, very unstable joint. But we knew that we can make this joint stable in this one particular direction by adding something. For example, putting some kind of constraints. So it stabilized. The knee replacement has stabilized. Hip replacement has more or less stabilized. And now is the common surgery done as far as joint replacement is concerned is shoulder replacement. It is inherent, no inherent stability. It is flat on one side and round on one side. Everything has to be held properly by way of soft tissue balance, by way of muscular balance, by way of alignment. Otherwise, the shoulder is waiting to dislocate anytime. On the top of it, we need a lot of mobility. That is the function of the shoulder. Even if it is stable and it cannot move in all direction, that shoulder arthroplasty is a failure. That's why shoulder arthroplasty is very tricky. It, you have to have a very good balance of stability as well as mobility. You want dono do. So how has shoulder replacement evolved? Let me quickly go through to make you understand why we are doing what we are doing. This was the first generation, what called monoblock. It had a round head of the humerus there. This will go into the uh, humerus shaft. And this was just one piece. It was mostly used for trauma more or less like a spacer. Remove the chura of, you know, the multiple pieces of the operator of humerus, just shove it in with cement, without cement. It used to mostly act like a spacer, not much function. And we very quickly realized that this one piece cannot do everywhere. So it has to be a second generation, which means they detach the head and the shaft like this. So you can put the shaft in, then you can put head the kind you like. It can be different sizes, it can be different width. And you can try to be a little bit smarter about balancing the shoulder better because now you have a choice of doing something during surgery on the table. That was second generation. Again, it worked better than first generation, but there were problems. Till this new very dynamic concept came about 20 years back, what is called third generation of anatomical prosthesis. Now this is what one has to understand. This is where we are today. So shoulder is not like a lollipop that there is a humerus and there is this thing sitting on the top of the humerus like this. It's not like that. It has different inclination, tilted like this, retroversion, offset, and head size. Now these four things vary at the upper end of the humerus from patient to patient. And variation is really wide. That's why if you put one size in every patient, it doesn't work. It either loses on stability or loses on control or loses on, you know, uh, pain relief, something happens if everything is not matched. That's why today's anatomical processes, which takes care of all these four aspects, it replaces what you remove and the way it was. You have to remove whatever was there in the body and remove it the way it was for that particular person. That is the trick. That is the problem why a shoulder placement is a little bit more difficult surgery because you have to match with that patient everything. And from this understanding started the journey of success of shoulder arthroplasty and that's what we are traveling. Let me right in the beginning tell about the basic indications. As per books, primary osteoarthritis is the most common indication of replacing the shoulder. Rheumatoid becomes another one, then fractures and rarely a vascular necrosis and cuff tear arthropathy. Unfortunately in our country, I think fractures are almost equal if not more than even primary osteoarthritis. Because our old people accept everything. All these categories of people have no problem. Even if they're handicapped, their family support, blah, blah, blah. But fracture is something devastating, 
particularly even in young people of 50, 60 years of age, that's where most often shoulder replacement is done in this country, which is different from most of the other countries, where aging population and osteo and rheumatoid are more common. How about non-orthoplasty option? One has always to think about these options before you even talk about orthoplasty. You can give steroid injection like in any other uh, osteoarthritic shoulder. Hyaluronidase has no role in my practice, nowhere, not even in the knee and definitely not in the shoulder. Physiotherapy can be done, but I've seen n number of patients where physiotherapy makes it worse. So very often these patients are erroneously treated as frozen shoulder. Patient goes for physiotherapy. Oh, doctor, physiotherapy ke baat to aur bhi kharab ho gaya. Dard aur bhi bad gaya. And that raises an alarm that something is wrong and arthroscopic surgery can be tried in selected cases. If this doesn't work, then you come down to shoulder replacement. So what are the types of shoulder replacement? Since the PG class, I'll keep it very basic. There are two types, basically anatomical and reverse. And I'll come to what it means. Anatomical means the way our anatomy is. You have a socket and you have a ball, like the shoulder is. It is like that. You replace the socket, replace the ball. That is called anatomical shoulder arthroplasty, the way natural body is. You can do it hemi, which means remove only the part, upper part of the humerus and replace it with a ball. Now that can be done in three different ways. First is called resurfacing, where you don't even remove the ball of the head. You just grind it, resurface it, ream it, and put a kind of a cap. That is called resurfacing. Now the similar to the, the cousin of resurfacing is what is called stemless hemi, where you remove the head part, just chop it off. The upper humerus is as it is, just chop off the ball part of the head and put an artificial thing. So this is just reaming and capping more or less. Head is still there. In this, there is no head. Just chop off the head, put an artificial head on top of that cut portion. The next is stamped hemi, which means once you remove the head, don't just put the head on top of the cut portion, ream into the medullary canal, and this head carries a stem with it. So most of the fixation goes through the stem. So these are three different types of hemiarthroplasty. You're only re replacing or doing something to the upper end of the humerus and nothing to the glenoid. That's why it is called hemiarthroplasty. If you do total shoulder replacement, which means you replace the glenoid as well as the head of the humerus, it is called total shoulder replacement. You are replacing both the components. Now this can again be stemless, which means you are, which means you are, uh, it is a stemless thing, you are replacing that, either of these three methods, most commonly this and sometimes this, this hardly ever, but you are only replacing the head without using the stem. Or you can do a stem, total shoulder, something like this, where you put a stem, put a head, and also replace the glenoid. So in anatomical way, either partial or full, if partial, these are three types, if full, these are the two types. Then we come to reverse shoulder, and I'll come to that, what it means. It's a very funny concept, and I'm sure for some of the postgraduate youngsters, it may not be very clear what it means. And then there is an in-between called plate from stem, where you can put a stem in the medullary cavernal, and on top of the stem, you can put either of these two. You can do a anatomical as well as reverse. That, that stem works for both. So that is another new development, that you can use a plate from stem depending on what you want to do on the table. This is an example of the type of shoulder processes available. This is resurfacing, it's just a cap on top of the head. Head has not been removed. Now here the head has been removed and we have replaced it with a ball with a stem. In the stemless, it is only this part. There's no stem here, only this part is replaced. And this is hemi because nothing has been done to glenoid, nothing has been done to glenoid here. This is a total shoulder replacement where you can see these two white dots show that the plastic is there which is not visible on the x-ray, but the glenoid is replaced by a kind of a, you know, shallow uh, plastic sheet, which is called glenoid processes. And on the humerus side, you replace the humerus with a stemmed implant. This is what is called reverse shoulder replacement, where you reversed everything. Why it is called reverse? Because the humerus head, or so-called ball, has come to the glenoid side, and the cup has come to the humerus side. So as against this, where the ball is on the humerus side, in this, the ball is on the glenoid side. That's why it is called reverse. And there's a very nice kind of logic and biomechanical logic of doing this rather funny, stupid looking operation, 
but it is one of the most successful and a favorite operation these it's like putting somebody upside down and it still it works so what is a reverse shoulder i would just like to give a little idea about that and for this you have to understand biomechanics of the shoulder joint a little bit i'll not go into too much detail the basic biomechanics of the shoulder is this the head has to be centered on the glenoid by something and then only your deltoid etc can work it's called force couple one part of the muscle which are rotator cuff muscles will put the head back to the glenoid hold it there kind of compress it there and then only this other muscles can lift it if these muscles are not there these muscles cannot produce the movement that we want to do <coughs> and i'll give you this example if this guy is to lift this stair from there he has to lift it unless he supports it on his leg here from his feet he cannot put force this and it will never lift if he removes his foot from here and he tries to lift the this thing the cd will come on this side so if you want to produce this movement there has to be a control from here that it means stabilizing and then the power working it is something similar that happens in the shoulder and that's how the normal shoulder replacement works that the you know the, the stabilizers are here the rotator cuff muscles and the deltoid is here as soon as the stabilizer compress this to the glenoid the deltoid can work and the shoulder movements happen now imagine a scenario when this cuff is not there for example the cuff is torn what will happen as i told you the deltoid will pull it up now this is going to happen once the cuff is torn and your deltoid contracts there is nothing to keep there is nothing to keep this head in the ground in the in the glenoid and the, it will move up like this and you cannot have any movement it will be like lifting it up and down without any functional movement and that's what happens when there is a rotator cuff injury and what is called you know pseudo paralysis etc because there is no way this biomechanics of the shoulder is functioning and it cannot function so what do we do then you can do this you want to center the joint so you can have a glenoid with a extra support which will not let the head go that side that's a very simple logical option and if the head the head does not go there if this head does not move in that direction this deltoid will be functional because now the head is in the center place it is where it should be this shelf is doing the job of rotator cuff it's a very simple logical option but it doesn't work that way why because center of the location uh, rotation is here and when you do this all the force goes in this shelf and what it does is over a period of time by repeated hitting on the shelf it makes this loose so it did not work this method of was tried early in the beginning but it did not work with this you not will get loose very fast because this head is trying to support on this and as you know it cannot take the support the whole the implant bone junction will loosen up no 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 no, no difficulty in understanding there because so much force all the force is going from here to here it will make it loose so the next idea came why not make some change that this is the part which gets loose the the the, the glenoid so called glenoid why not do something that the center of rotation is shifted here that means whenever you move the arm there is the center of rotation is right at the base of the glenoid that means there is no forces no shear forces on the glenoid and how can you do it it's not possible so the idea came why not reverse that means put this glenoid sphere here and now when this arm moves the center of rotation is here this is the arc on which it is moving but the center of rotation is here so the chances of this loosening at this glenoid or so called glenoid and bone junction have become less because there is no shear force at the center of location which was here because of a big arm as you know the liver how the liver works longer is the liver more is the force here now there is no liver here right at the base is the center of rotation so by changing the glenosphere like making it reverse it was a very intelligent move that even without a rotator cuff now this head can move around this glenosphere without creating any loosening here because the center of rotation is right there that's the philosophy of how reverse shoulder works now how long do the, do these last just for your knowledge there are n number of studies that shoulder replacement lasts more than 15 years in 90% of cases and even reverse lasts more than 10 years so we prefer reverse in anybody more than 65 70 minimum this can be done at earlier age because if it fails you can always do reverse in those cases 
but these are 10 to 15 years result operation these days and these are fairly old reports where in in 85 percent of cases these joint replacement have lasted for 15 years i'm sure it is 20 years now so reverse or shoulder replacement is nearly as successful as any other replacement of the body we are just going there just the last slide how do you decide which shoulder replacement will you do in a particular patient the key deciding point as i told you is rotator cuff if cuff is okay or is repairable if it is not so there is no cuff it is not repairable you cannot do a anatomical shoulder you have to do a reverse shoulder so first thing that we examine is is the cuff okay if cuff is okay or is repairable then yes it is possible to do total shoulder we may not be able to requiring a reverse shoulder and then we decide the age of the patient if the age of the patient is less less than 70 glenoid is normal more or less and only head is not damaged you can do resurfacing it's just arthritis cartilage is gone but glenoid is reasonably okay head is reasonably not damaged you can do resurfacing you can do hemiarthroplasty stemless suppose the glenoid is okay but head is badly damaged then you cannot do resurfacing then you have to do hemi of some kind or even total replacement if the glenoid is not okay suppose the patient is older in that patient usually both are damaged head as well as glenoid and one would more often than not prefer doing a doing a total replacement or a hemi replacement depending on requirement of that person but if the head is damaged and the glenoid is also damaged more and more people are shifting in a 70 plus one operation which is very predictable is reverse shoulder replacement so reverse shoulder replacement somehow has become so popular because its success rate is quite high that if person is more than 70 and there is any doubt about his rotator cuff any doubt about his shape of the glenoid any doubt about bone stock then one has a tendency to move to reverse but if the patient is active everything is fine you can also do total shoulder replacement i think that chart gives an idea about how do we decide about which one to do in which patient based on damage of the cuff based on age based on damage to the glenoid and also damage to the head on these four bases we can have this flow chart to understand which one is required in a particular patient thank you for your kind attention